together from the letter to the Hebrews. I'm going to read chapter 4 this evening, the first 13 verses of chapter 4. And if you want to follow in the church Bible, you'll find that on page 1002. Page 1002, large prints, if you've picked one up from the back, 1189. Will Allen, our assistant minister, will be preaching this evening. And so let's hear God's Word together. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as He has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news, failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Amen. <laughs> well, Alan, I'm the assistant here. Um, Alan will be digging into Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, now, this, this evening, as we continue through Hebrews, we, we stopped last week, kind of in the middle of a section, uh, a section looking at God's people experience of, of being in the wilderness, particularly uh, through Psalm uh, 95. But in the, the midst of the wilderness this week, uh, the eyes of our hearts are encouraged to see something else. And it's this, it's rest, rest. What a word. I wonder what comes to mind uh, for you with that word. Perhaps it's a feeling, a, a peace, a calm, uh, a, a deep joy perhaps and freedom. Or perhaps a place comes to mind. Perhaps it's like a, a sun-soaked corner of your garden or a, a favorite coffee shop or a heathered-covered hillside. I know places where, where weight is, is lifted off our shoulders. We saw last, last time that life in this world it is being in a wilderness. It can be dry and dusty. It can be a place of hard work and travel. Uh, sin and death have, have left their fingerprints everywhere. It's also a place of danger. If you remember last time, a place where people can fall from God, fall away from God, and the, the burden can feel heavy on our shoulders. And last week there was a warning, a warning to take care take care that we don't fall in the wilderness. But here in chapter 4, God lifts our eyes, lifts our eyes to, to what's on the other side of the wilderness. And the, the key thing he wants us to know is this, the, the place of God's rest awaits us. The place of God's rest awaits us. I hope and pray that as we spend time in this truth tonight, it will, it will capture our longings and, and kind of put fire in our bellies to get there. 
Now, God has rest for us. It's right there in, in 4 verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. Uh, it's there in verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest. Now, that rest, it's, it's going to be a, a state of rest, isn't it? A quality of time, the end of our work and our toil, and we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. But before we get to the quality, God wants us to know it's, it's a place of rest. Now remember how the writer's trying to get us to think. He's, he's put us in the wilderness with God's people. A people heading to the land of Canaan. And even though, as we're going to see, and we thought about last week as well, that the, the land of Canaan isn't the final rest of God's people, we can't escape how that land is making us think about the future, the final future awaiting God's people. It's helping us see it's a place. that The land of Canaan is pointing us to a place of eternal rest. In Hebrews 11, the writer uh, puts it in a, in, in a different way. He calls it a better country. That is a heavenly one. And this is a wonderful thing. Rest takes on a much bigger vision in our, our hearts and minds. It's, it's not just a feeling it's a place. It's, it's not just an escape from work. It's, it's all-encompassing. And it's more than just a corner of your garden. It's a heavenly country. It's a place of security and flourishing, a place of freedom from enemies, a place to put down roots and share life with others. The place of God's rest awaits his people. So as we begin to delve into what this rest is like, perhaps picture it there on the horizon. Okay, in, the, in, the, in the, book, um, the Narnia book, the horse and his boy, uh, the horse and, and his boy are trying to get to, uh, to the north, to Archenland, to Narnia. And to get there, they have to cross this enormous desert. But sitting on the horizon are the mountains of Archenland, their destination. Okay, so even as they step onto the hot sand, they can see where they want to be. And as we live in the, in the wilderness, have the, the mountains of rest on the horizon. Have the, the heavenly country visible as you, as you scramble over sun-baked rocks and pitch your tent under the stars with fellow travelers. Look up and see God's rest awaits. Now, the, the writer really wants to teach us, firstly, of its reality. Okay? It's not a mirage. And then he's, he's going to give us a, a couple of little photos kind of of what it's going to be like. So firstly, we, we need to see it, it's real and it's ready. It's real and it's ready. Verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now here the writer, he's beginning his argument proving God's place of rest. It's real. Now as we're going to see, it's a, it's a tightly knit argument. So you've got your, your brains in gear. But again, we're back in Psalm 95 here. And this oath from God that comes at the end of the psalm, they shall not enter my rest. Now, now to say they shall not enter it means there's something they could have entered. Here's my rest, but they couldn't enter it. And that rest actually has been there, has always been there, verse 3, right from the foundation of the world. Let me say that again, that the place of rest, God's rest that he has on the future horizon for us, has actually always existed. Now, how do we know? Because of what's said in Genesis 2. If we look at verse 4, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And now he quotes Genesis 2. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. He's saying rest is established in creation. So God, for six days, he worked. He created the heavens and the earth. He put stars in the sky and fish in the seas. And he, finally on day six, he created man and woman, the pinnacle of his work. And then day seven... He rested, the first ever Sabbath, God rested. And not from ever doing anything again, but from his works of creation. So as he rested, it's as if his heavenly places become a place of rest. 
And the writer to Hebrews is, is connecting that rest, that rest, that Sabbath rest of God himself in Genesis 2 with the rest of Psalm 95. Okay, so verse 5, and again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. My rest, God's rest. Well, what rest must be talking about? Well, the rest of Genesis 2. The rest that awaits God's people. It's real, okay? It's as, a, as real as the creation we enjoy. It's as real as the, the skin on your body and the air we breathe. Why? Because it was established at exactly the same time in creation itself. It's real. Now, this doesn't get rid of the idea that, that God will resurrect creation when Jesus returns. Instead, this, this real place in, in the heavenly realms will come to earth, just as John saw in Revelation. But the key thing is this isn't a pipe dream for us. Okay? It's, it's real right now in heaven, so it will be real in the future. You know, Saying there's a rest for people in the future, it's not some kind of hollow platitude. You know, sometimes people question religion and, and, and wonder, you know, how can the hope of heaven, the hope of God's future rest ever really be any hope? They just kind of see it as an empty platitude for those who are scared of death, like a, a nicely wrapped present with nothing inside. But no, it, think of it more like an airplane pilot trusting in his parachute. You know, to, to know his parachute is on his back, like that's not a hollow delusion, is it? He can trust it because it's real. Sure, if it was like a child's toy with a rug inside it, then you'd say, you know, that's a delusion of his. But it's not. It's, a, you know, it's full of a sophisticated saving machine, a parachute. You know, the fact that God's rest is real means it's not an empty, hollow platitude like a child's toy. It's a certain hope for God's people. It's already begun. It's always been. It always will be. That's how real it is. And also, it's, it's ready. It's ready. Now, in verse 6, the writer turns his attention to whether this rest is still open for people of many more generations. Okay, so it's clearly there, verse 6, since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it. Now, we know the wilderness generation, if you remember back to last week, they were not allowed to enter it because of their disobedience. So was it just then for the next generation, the, the children of those who died in the wilderness, they, they got to enter the land of, of Canaan? Did that mean they're the only ones to finally enter the rest? Well, here the writer turns to the word today. Today in Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you look at verse 7, again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying, through David so long afterwards. Okay, now here's the crunch, that this rest must be ready for many generations because David wrote the psalm. Okay, let me explain. Now, David was in the land of Canaan when he wrote it, okay? And Joshua, many years before, had brought them into the land of Canaan and given the people a form of rest. Rest from their enemies, a fixed land, and even David, years later, when we get into 2 Samuel, we'll see he creates a kind of rest. After he becomes king, he subdues his enemies across uh, all his borders. And yet, verse 8, if Joshua had given them rest, implying he didn't, God would not have spoken of another day later on. You know, if David could say so long afterwards, today do not harden your hearts, then this rest must be also there for all of God's people, whether they were in the land or not, whether they were fighting enemies or not. God's real rest, it's established in creation, yes, but it's ready. It's ready for God's people. Verse 9, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's real and it's ready. This is extraordinary grace. God has placed before his people not a mirage, but something concrete. You know, as we sweat and toil in the heat of the wilderness, as we experience difficulty and heartache, as we see the fruits of our labor go to waste, as God says, my rest, the rest I began in creation, it's ready. 
there is another day, a day coming when those who've believed enter that rest. Isn't that amazing? But not only that, the, the writer wants to give us a little glimpse of what it's going to be like, like photos of the destination. And he says it's going to be God exalting and God like. God exalting and God like. In verse 9, we start to get our first little glimpse. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Not just a rest, but a Sabbath rest. Rest. Now that phrase, it's just, it's just one word in the original. Perhaps we could say, there remains a Sabbathing uh, for the people of God. Not just a rest. Sorry, uh, but, but what is a Sabbathing? What is that? Well, sometimes we can think of rest as, as meaning just not working, not doing anything. But actually, God's rest is better than that. There's something to it. It's not just the end of work. It's Sabbathing. It's doing Sabbath. It's, think of it like it's emptying our hands of all our tools of work. You know, whether they're hammers or computer keyboards or washing up brushes or writing pens, it's the ending of our slog and toil, emptying our hands of those things and then lifting them up in praise and worship. The Sabbath, it's the day of worship. It's the day of praise. It's, it's celebration and, and glorying in all God has done for his people. It's, it's lifting up Jesus Christ in song and, and sitting down to eat at his wedding banquet. It'll be God exalting. Now, often life can make us think the only way to rest is by doing nothing, by slobbing in front of the TV or lying in the sun or something, a complete switch off. But there are other ways to rest. We know that we could draw a picture, we could go for a walk, we can write a story, eat a lovely meal with friends. And, and often that kind of rest can be a much deeper and more refreshing one. And that's just a little taster of Sabbath rest. God, he hasn't got emptiness for us at the end. He's got a glorious, God-exalting celebration for us. C.S. Lewis speaks of how actually all our, our different experiences of beauty and joy, like those, those moments of refreshing rest, how there's, there's often something incredible and yet also painful about them because they come and then they go, don't they? We have a great party, it happens and we love it, but then it disappears. We, we we've kind of feel like we've been spectators of them. And, and it's this longing that they evoke for them to last. He says it's this that points us to the better country. You know, the beautiful scent of a flower points us to the flower we've not yet smelt. The sound of glorious music is the, the echo of a tune we've not yet heard. You know, rest and celebration in our normal lives, it's, it's tasting a place we haven't yet experienced. The place of God himself. The source of all beauty and joy and truth. That's what our heart yearns for. And that's what our hearts are going to get a place where we can exalt in God himself. Just think of the idea of a celebration. It's a, it's a wonderful thing because celebrations never have another agenda in mind. It doesn't have a greater end goal. You know, often we rest in order to be able to work harder, don't we? We, we sleep at the end of the day because we know we need more energy to work the next day. But we never celebrate in order to work harder. We celebrate to celebrate. That's the point. And, and final Sabbath thing, it's going to be a rest from toil and work. Yes, but it will be a celebration. A celebration of God, not for any other reason, but to celebrate and enjoy God's. He is our greatest joy. He is our greatest delight. A satisfaction for our souls. It's going to be God exalting. But it's not just that. It's also, it's also going to be God-like. Verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. There's something profound here. Humans, when they get to God's place of rest, they're going to be like God's. As we come to the end of our works of toil, so we will find ourselves entering into what God has been doing since creation this was always the end goal of humanity. It was right there for Adam to work, to toil, and then to enter God's rest. That's how we bear his image. And in the end, we will rest like God. But it's not just that we will do as God does. It's closer than that. We're like him because we will actually 
enter into his rest. We'll rest in his rest. Remember the promise, we will enter my rest. It's the, it's the place of his rest. And so somehow, it's just a bit mind-blowing, we, we will participate in this divine life, the rest of God. You know, as image bearers, we'll do as God does. You know, it's like a little picture of it, like a child who for many years watches her dad get a, get a boat out and sail on the shimmering lake, you know, gliding through the waves, putting out the sails, holding tightly to the rudder. And, and then one day, her, her dad takes her by the hand and, and she gets to push the boat out. She gets to sail, not on her own, but they do it together. They sail it together. She joins in with him. The place of God's rest awaits his people. And it will be God-like because we'll rest with him. It's real and it's ready. It'll be God-exalting and God-like. What a place, what a rest. So how should we respond? Verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Last week we had stand while we're walking. Well, this week it's strive to rest. Strive to rest. This, this rest sits before us. It's like the Israelites. We're, we're not there yet. It's a, it's a promise of what will be, what will come, and it's tugging at our hearts. And, and what that means is we live with both promise and warning sitting over us. The extraordinary promise that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. But also the stark warning. It's there in 319. Some were unable to enter because of unbelief. No wonder in verse 12 the writer turns to consider the word of God. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God has spoken, he's, and his word of promise and warning, it, you know, it's not like a local advert in a corner shop, you know, one of those that some might have a look at, but most people just kind of ignore and walk past. No, no God's word, it, it's living and active. It's more like a, a summons from the courts. It demands a response. And this, this word of promise and warning, it's fallen on deaf ears before, and is now calling again. It's calling us again for, to belief and obedience. As long as it's called today. You know, and like we sang about in Psalm 139, God sees all, verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We will give an account. God sees all. So under this word of promise and warning, we must strive to rest. While the promise still stands, we mustn't miss out. But, but what does it mean to strive? Now, there's, there's some different things we need to think about here. But firstly, striving, you know, it's, it's about focus and priorities, isn't it? Dogged determination and discipline. When I mentioned the word strive to someone this week, they said, well, that sounds like hard work. Well, it is. You know, it's like a fell runner, you know, driving their burning legs up a steep mountain path on the way to a finish line. So we must strive to enter that rest. The, the destination sits on the horizon and, and we work hard to get there. You know, sometimes we think good things just fall into our laps. Now, in one sense, salvation does, doesn't it? In Hebrews, we've seen it's the Son who brings many sons to glory. It's the Son who tasted death for others and, and, and defeated it, freeing us from its power. It's the Son who dealt with our sins and with Satan. We know salvation is all through Jesus. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's grace and kindness to us. So, so striving here, it can't mean earning salvation. It can't mean that we turn up on the, the threshold to God's rest and say, look God, you know, here's all my striving. Here are my good works. I deserve to get in. No, not at all. We, we don't hand him our CV and our cover letter showing all that we've done. Not at all. It's by God's grace and kindness in Jesus. 
Yet we are to strive. So instead, I wonder if a helpful phrase is, is patient urgency. Not earning, but urgency. That's what striving is. Patient urgency. Patient because we're in the wilderness. It's not as if we can just kind of run a bit faster to get across the finish line. It's a hard slog in the wilderness. We don't know when Jesus will return. We, we don't know when we might die. There's a patience to it. But striving, there's an urgency to it. If this kind of rest sits before us, how could we not make it of first importance? To strive, it's to know the glory and the wonder of it and so make it the defining feature of our lives. You know, last week we saw that the, the life of faith in the wilderness was one, if you remember, where we considered Jesus deeply, knowing he's over us, where we took care of our hearts before him, where we encouraged each other on the way. If you missed it, have a read of Hebrews chapter 3 later on. But, but knowing this kind of rest sits before us should mean there's an urgency to those things an effort to them, a focus. You know, we giving deliberate time in our weeks to spending time with Jesus, taking seriously our hearts and our sin, pursuing fellow believers with love and with wisdom. Christ, he's bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Do we want to be part of that? Now, it's, it's important to say we do have many wonderful gifts to enjoy in this life, don't we? We do share in the life of Jesus in some way now. You know, so as we enjoy gifts in this world, I don't know, like like time with friends or with uh, satisfying work or success at a hobby, it's, it's like we're getting a drink from an oasis along the way. But we mustn't forget where we are. We're still in the wilderness. I wonder if it at different stages of life, different aspects of the wilderness can kind of creep in and and weaken our striving, soften our hearts, you know, our efforts, sorry, lessen our urgency. Now, often I think they're good desires, but they become more and more significant, like the the good desire to get married, the good desire to do well at uni, the, the good desire to raise your children well and see them flourish, the good desire to succeed at work. But soon our eyes just get transfixed by those things. Our urgency in the wilderness just slows. Christ starts to fade from view. Our our, our seat at church becomes empty. Our Bibles get dusty. Our hands rarely closed in prayer. We get lazy with sin and as as our hearts harden, we we become happier with doing wrong, more blasé about things we used to want to put to death. We're, We're okay with our grumpiness or short temper. We're not feeling uh, as guilty as we look at porn again and again. And God's place of rest, that place that once held our eyes, it just fades in the haze of the sunshine. And rather than trying to fix our gaze on it, we let it drift. It soon becomes like a memory, an old story your parents once told you, a dream perhaps. But may that not be us. May we be those who persevere in the wilderness. Let us strive to enter that rest. Christ is bringing those who trust in him to glory. He has destroyed the barrier of sin and death. God's place of rest sits before us. I want to be there. Do you? Do we? Well, if so, strive to rest. Let's have a patient urgency. Let's hold fast to Jesus, the founder of our faith. Because the glorious place of God's rest awaits us. Amen.